This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Thursday, February the 13th in the year 2014 here at the Niles Public Library in the third floor boardroom. My name is Neil O'Shea and I'm a member of the reference staff at the Niles Public Library and I'm privileged to be speaking um, this morning uh, with Mr. Kenneth Lee. Uh, Mr. Lee um, was born in Chicago um, on February the 20th, 1927. So he has a birthday coming up and uh, he has cons kindly consented to be interviewed um, for this project. Um, Mr. Lee heard of the Veterans History Project at the Niles Library through the uh, annual Veterans History Project uh, breakfast. I'm very much looking forward to conversing with uh, with Mr. Lee because his uh, his military record is very interesting because he served in two wars, the World War II and the Korean War, and in a, a different branch of service in each. He began in the, uh, the Navy in World War II and then in the Army uh, for the Korean War. So um, I think we'll begin. So Mr. Lee, uh, when did you enter the service? That would have been in World War II. Uh, was that the I enlisted in April of 1944, and I was called up as of July 1st of 1944. And I was in until June 28th of 1946. Where were you living at the time you were called up? When I enlisted, mm -hmm. I was li uh, living in Brookfield, Illinois. Um, had you completed high school at that time? Or? Yes. Because of the war, we got out of high school the end of February. And that was to permit us to go to college because the draft wasn't until you're 18 years of age. But I chose to enlist in April. It was a chance that I could get some college education because of enlisting at that time. So you were actually 17 when you? I was 17. When you enlisted. Um, there was a great feeling of patriotism in the country at that time, I, I think. Yes, uh, I was a member of the Sons of the American Legion. And as a result, uh, unbeknownst to me, that uh, immediately I became an American Legion when I enlisted. And that was forwarded on later on in my uh, uh, pay grades. They gave me credit for the time from when I was enlisted and the time I went into service. So that must have been a, a being a young person at that that time quite a unusual environment to be in. I suppose you're finishing up your last semester in high school and then you're thinking about what you're going to do when there's a war on. And uh, I was thinking about it earlier than that. Uh, I was at a basketball game on December 7th with my father and uh, they stopped the game and announced that uh, Pearl Harbor had been uh, uh, bombed and attacked. And I turned to my dad and uh, I said, where's Pearl Harbor? And he didn't know. Nobody knew, I don't think, at that time. And uh, it prepared me for the fact that uh, uh, my uncle was going in, my other uncle was going into the service, and uh, as a result, uh, I knew I was going to go into service because it was it was pretty uh, bad at that time. So. Um there was just a general acceptance in the family that you would be going and there was... Yeah, I, I had the idea. In fact, I'm doing some memoirs and everything and I'm, I'm toying with different titles. And, uh, I felt that uh, 
really I was born to die and then things turned different then I was born to live and it's uh, I'm started it I've been a, I've got a lot of material that I've written uh, I was a good letter writer and I took notes some of which I brought here today and uh, it was one of those things that I, I knew I was going to go in. May I ask what high school you attended? I attended St. Philip High School. Uh, it's now called St. Philip Basilica High School but then it went, uh, closed down in late 1960. They still have a reunion uh, the first weekend in May, all class reunion, and I go to that. Uh, I was the class of 44, and uh, there isn't too many people that uh, are showing up at uh, the table. <laughs> so that was, um, am I recalling? That was a West Side High School in Chicago, yeah, right? It was roughly at uh, Kedzie Avenue and Jackson Boulevard. And were the Servites taught there? Servites and the Viatorian fathers. The Servite brothers, part of their education was to teach in the school, and they attended uh, Loyola. Uh, and a lot of the, the brothers that taught me be, became priests, and uh, I kept in contact with a lot of them. Uh, after I got out of uh, the service and I traveled with my my company. So um, when you enlisted, um, d you chose the Navy then? Yes. Was there, you, you could swim or you weren't afraid of water or uh, I, any I reason why you I couldn't swim very well. <laughs> I had, uh, I had uh, an accident as a younger uh, at a pool in, uh, uh, in which I dove too deep and I hit the bottom of the, of the pool and it, just, it uh, frightened me a little bit. But uh, we uh, used to take vacations up to Lake Geneva and uh, but I was not really a, a good swimmer, you know. But you chose the you chose the navy. Yes. Was there a, was had any of your did you mention your uncles or yours anybody in the family had gone navy or any of your friends? Or uh, my one uncle had gone into the navy. He he uh, was late. Uh, he he was at the upper part of the draft. He was uh, close to 38 years old when he went in. My other uncle was only nine years older than I. Uh, he was in the Army, and he was an officer in the Army and Transportation Corps. And uh, the, uh, throughout the, later on, uh, different cousins of mine went in. Uh, neighbors in where I lived, uh, we lost a close neighbor in 1942. Uh, his plane was shot down in the Pacific, and it was very uh, tragic at that time. So, Mr. Mr. Lee, you were when they say you were inducted, that would have been downtown Chicago, and then you took a train, yeah. or a train to Great Lakes, or no? I uh, we we were in the uh, insurance and exchange building, as I recall, and. Uh, they uh, took us right through the train station. We we went down to uh, uh, DePaw in Greencastle, Indiana. Uh, we were to uh, study there and take all our uh, boot camp physical education down down there, and we took anywhere from 18 to 20 credit hours uh, in classes, um, basic classes. And the reason for it, it, coming out of high school, they had used up all the young men that were in college. 
and they had started that program to get officers for the Navy, and that was this was the, going to be the the addition to it because they were running out of officers because of the the battles that were occurring in the Pacific, and uh, the the way it worked out is that we went th three trimesters in a calendar year and after four tr trimester, four of the tri two years of college, at that point we would become a midshipman in preparation to become an ensign. So you were on a, an officer track then, yes. were you? And that was because of an aptitude test or education? My, I was high. I was had good grades in in high school, and as a result, uh, I continued with my education. So was that the um, was that the first time you were away from home for an extended period of time? Uh, other than uh, visits to my grandparents in Indiana, but mostly. Uh, I had only traveled between uh, Indiana and Wisconsin, yeah. and uh, I hadn't traveled around much at all. There must have been a lot of other different types of people there from different parts of the country. Oh yeah, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, men that were overseas that quali qualified to join that program, they came off their ships and were brought in with us. And of course, we were 17 and 18 years old, and they were 22 or 23 years old, and they hadn't been to college, but they got the opportunity to go to college, and they already had sea duty. So as a result, some of those, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to uh, room with uh, some of the individuals, and um, in most cases, I, I kept track of them throughout. Even to this day, there, I still know people that, yeah. that go back to the f middle 40s. Yeah. There can be quite a bit of difference between a 17 and 18 year old and a 22 and a 23 year old, especially when they've been you know, overseas already. And uh, it, was a, it was an interesting thing because uh, a lot of us were athletes in high school, and uh, I never smoked in my life. I was given the choice of, if you want to you want to smoke or do you want to play basketball? And I wanted to play basketball, so I never smoked. And it carried on, and the people I associated, the 17 and 18 year old, the one fellow was a very close friend. His dad was a coach of basketball. He never smoked. It was a natural for, for us to be together. Did you get a chance to play basketball when you were at? Uh uh, Rec I played down at uh, in an intramural type thing uh, at, at college. I didn't make the varsity. I was too short. <laughs> uh, I was 5'8". Uh, uh, I played uh, basketball for all four years at high school, though, on the ju junior team. Was that 5'9"? 5'8 and, and under. 5'8 and under, yeah. Yeah. Um, It says your your unit or division was the V12. Yes. What what did, what does that signify? That uh, that was just uh, uh, they had various uh, groups. They had a V5, which were Navy people that were going into the Navy Air Corps. So that was a separate. Uh, they had different names, uh, letters that went. Uh, these were, you know, basically volunteer the V. Uh, they could might be volunteer or might be victory, but uh, we did have some army. They had a an army uh, contingent at that school also for army officers. They were doing the same thing as the navy, except, and they would go on to uh, their officer training, and the V five would go to their flight training. And then the V-12 went to either supply or to uh, 
What was the other one? Engineering. On, on dental and uh, pre-dental de pre and pre-medical also that was in the V12. So during these, these two years, the two years of your service in the Navy, most of the time is spent going to school or developing as an officer? Yes. We, uh, we get, as we got into the program more, uh, after 16 months, then we, we, we start getting more military training. Uh, I was transferred to Purdue University because the war was turning in our favor, but they didn't know what to do with us because they might not need us uh, because uh, you know, in '45, the the European war was over, and everything shifted to the Pacific. And uh, as a result of that, uh, at Peru, uh, I was taking uh, uh, courses in seamanship and damage control and communication, uh, celestial navigation, uh, which I didn't have at the at DePaul down in Greencastle. Did you ever get on the water when you were in Indiana? No, never got on the water. Other other than uh, cooling my feet in the <laughs> river <laughs> in the summertime. It was yeah. hot down there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we uh, after when we went to Purdue, I was not uh, going to be an engineer, and you can only get a BS at that time, mm -hmm. a Bachelor of Science at Purdue. You couldn't get a Bachelor of Arts. <coughs> because of that, uh, they separated us after uh, one semester there. It says, and uh, there was 12 of us that were transferred to the University of Pennsylvania the Wharton School of Business, and uh, we got more classes in regard to economics and accounting. And it's a wonderful school. Yeah. Yes. It was a very big school, you know, even in those days. Uh, from DePaul, uh, without the Navy, they would have no no students there. They had one one dormitory for uh, people that. Uh, possibly were uh, unable to be in the service or young enough, uh, there were less than 200 men there. So they had a lot of girls that would uh, join the, the crowd down there. And it was uh, a situation that there were a lot of men there, but we did, there was very few girls to, if you wanted to have a date, yeah. you know, like you, I can remember asking a girl for a date, and it would be about two and a half months Great. before she was open for a date. You know. Yeah. But uh, when we went to Pennsylvania, then we did uh, things in the water, uh, how to uh, uh, abandon ship and use cargo nets and this stuff. That, that must have felt good to you. Well, yeah, we had to jump in the water with uh, a lot of debris in the uh, in the pool, you know, as a result of this, to simulate, you know, uh, putting your arms up to protect your face. Uh, but you could still hit your elbows and everything else with the, the debris that was floating down there. You just tried to pick a spot. You weren't thinking about the time you hit your head in the pool, no? No. <laughs> when you went in, no. no, I didn't just think of that. Yeah. But that, uh, that's uh, the situation we were in. We didn't know what they didn't know what to do with us, and the war was coming to an end. And uh, they made a decision, and because we were we had signed up when I was 17, I was going to be in there until I was 21. It was a, what they call a more a minority uh, situation. And the only way that we could get out is uh, convenience of the government, C-O-G. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, that's what they chose. They gave us an option. We could stay in and continue on with the peacetime program, which is the uh, Naval ROTC program, which is still in existence now. Uh, but <laughs> you had to complete a peacetime course, and then you would have to serve another two years no, uh, I believe, no, 18 months in the Navy after that. That was the requirement. It was like, and at that point, uh, I chose to get out and go into the Naval Reserve uh, as an inactive Naval Reserve. And uh, I had the GI Bill. I could finish up my education and uh, go on with my life. Uh, that's what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> But you, at that time, you didn't. Um, your heart wasn't set on being a navy officer and having a ship and sailing the seas no. or something. No. 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 I, I, uh, I at that point, I decided the schools were uh, three different patterns of uh, enrollment. It was less than two thousand at DePaul. I went to Purdue at that time. It was about seven thousand. And I went to Pennsylvania, it was about 15,000. And as soon as I got to Pennsylvania, uh, the Wharton School of Business, I, you know, when you're in a lecture hall that says uh, number 315, they didn't know your name. They just knew a number for you. And uh, I immediately applied to go back to DePaul and transfer whatever credits I earned but all the military credits couldn't transfer. They didn't, they didn't want that. So there were a lot of us went back there to graduate. That was the easiest. So the DePaul set up a program for the military that would come back because uh, I had to learn a language that was a requirement of DePaul. And I had, was able to take uh, a course at Purdue uh, in Spanish, uh, because I had some, it was the only open class that I could take. I had one three hour uh, class that I could take, so I said, oh, I'll take that. Uh, I, oh, I, I take that back. Uh, I did have a business law course I took, I took two of them there. And uh, that was uh, able to be transferred down. Uh, I don't think I, I transferred anything from Wharton School of Business down there. But I was, when I got back to the school in 46, uh, September of 46, so I went back to DePauw, they had arranged that they would have special language courses in which, for the military uh, only, uh, in fact, I don't think there was uh, maybe one or two uh, girls that qualified for it that were in the class. We had it every day, five, five days a week, plus the following year we had another three-hour three, uh, three class, so it was eight, eight hours of Spanish, <laughs> but I still had to get my mathematics courses in. So I was taking math and Spanish uh, my senior year and I, I had the qualifications of everything, 128 credit hours, but of all the schooling I had, I had 168 or 169 credit hours, but those were all the Navy courses that I, I couldn't do anything with. So, so I graduated when I was 20 years old from college. Wow, from DePaul. Yeah, with your bachelor of bachelor of arts at the age of 20. In, yeah, in mathematics. In mathematics. Who would have? Now that the fun began, I I got a job. Okay, in industrial statistics, right in my line of business and everything else. I, uh, well, I, I worked for Western Electric, 
in, in the Hawthorne plant. So, when you, be, because of the wonderful, I mean, you had you, you worked hard, but you did secure. It sounds like a, an, a wonderful education. Yeah. It, 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 um, kind of matched your abilities and aptitudes. You d you didn't have any difficulty then when you finished your college education. You didn't have a difficulty securing a job like some. No, no you were in at Western. Oil. Right. I got the job. It's very interesting. I went to night school that they provided for industrial statistics. I got course recognition for that. I was that's so first in my mind. So now I come around to, I'm turning 21, and I said uh, to myself, I said, I'm going to go back to graduate work. So I, get, I, I worked for 14 months uh, for Western Electric, and I, I gave notice. I said, I'm going back to school. There was no problem. But uh, two months later, they had a cutback at the Western Electric. Anybody that didn't have two years of service was, was going to be laid off. Well, I would have been laid off two months later, and it would be in the this, this middle of the semester uh, at school. That I did it in August, and the end of September was uh, the cutoff date. I would have been out of a job. And uh, I couldn't get into school because it was too late, because they had gone to a September. They went to two semesters, you know. So what school did you take your graduate courses at then? Well, I took graduate courses at DuPont in mathematics. Back at DuPont? Yeah. So you had it? Right. Uh, I was taking a classroom and about to start on my thesis, and I had a health problem. And in December, it was either cut back on something or quit altogether. So I talked to my counselor, uh, Professor Eddington, and he suggested that I just delay the thesis and just get the coursework in and see how you, you know, then they'll make a decision on that. So I did that for the entire year. So I had all the coursework done, but I still had the medical problem. Were, were you still were you able to use the GI Bill for the master's yeah. work you were? Yeah, it was the the tuition was unbelievably low compared to what it is now. You, it's yeah. you must have liked Greencastle, Indiana. I did. I, I did. Uh, it was small, uh, very interesting. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting things happened in that town that people don't know. Uh, John Delinger robbed the bank there, and uh, Abraham Lincoln had his casket come when he uh, died, and he went up through Illinois and down through Indiana, and there's. Plaques. There's. They had the Underground Railroad that went through there in the Civil War. It was a very it's a lot of history there. I I I, I really love it. Yeah. You know. A good friend of mine uh, graduated from DePaul, and I think at one time his father was on the board there. His his last name was Steele. S T E E L E. No, I'll have to ask Richard. But yeah. 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 So th that's what I did, and you know, and I, uh, I didn't get my master's. Um, I came back uh, looking for a job then. Uh, it was now uh, 40, uh, let's say, what, 49. And uh, I was interviewing downtown. I had a, a person that was helping me from Brookfield that uh, and he set up an interview with the uh, uh, company downtown, and I was walking to the train station, and in those days I passed a phone booth, so I called him, and uh, I said, do you have any other uh, 
situations that I could see. You know, he says, I'm, I'm walking at a train station. And, you know, it's, it's, it's about noontime. And I said, uh, you got anything for the afternoon? And he said, yeah, I, I placed somebody at, uh, uh, in the opera building right, uh, right by the train station, uh, all state insurance. So uh, he said, here's a name, I uh, asked for this person, you know, Mr. Brazier. So I went up, went up there and uh, there was a receptionist and there was, he go, to the right was Mr. Brazier. So I went there and right away he said, well, you're, you're, you've got too much education for this job, <laughs> you know. They were rehiring people that were coming out of the service and everything. He says, but over in the, the home office, which is the corporate office, is the other way, uh, Mr. Blackman. So uh, he called and asked for uh, Bill Blackman. And uh, I, just, I said, uh, I have a young man here that might, you might be interested in. It. I went over there, and so that I walked in there, I noticed Mr. Blackman's shoes. They're spit and polish. And I said, you were in the Navy, weren't you? And he looked at my shoes, and he said, you were in the Navy? Yeah. Well, it, I went around. I interviewed with about five different people. Everybody that was an assistant, you know, uh, to the president. It's a good sign. Yeah. And I went in there, I went to the this person who was the actuarial uh, person, and I had all this math background. I had life insurance courses that I had taken, and they hired me. And that was, the insurance company was called? Allstate. Allstate. You know, it was owned by Sears at that yeah. time. And uh, I went to, went into that and I was, uh, they were replacing uh, a lot of the, in fact there's a picture I brought with the young lady that was, uh, they were the supervisors, they didn't have many men supervisors. And there was only one man supervisor at that, and I, I was working for uh, a young lady that could run the, you know, we didn't have any uh, computers in those days. We had tabulating equipment, but that that was it. So you working? You had a, you, in a, you were working for a, a lady supervisor, which yeah. would have been a new, I suppose it would have been a new experience at that oh, time. Yeah. yeah, that that was that was something. So it, it's a situation changed. Did you move? Did your did you did your family move from the west side of Chicago to? Brookfield, or you're always in Brookfield, and you. No, I, I moved there when I was three years old. My uh, uh, my mother, it's birthday today. She was born at the Hawthorne Racetrack in the infield, because the, my grandfather was a uh, groom there, and that and that's where they provided living quarters with the with the horses. You know, that's where she was born. And uh, I was born in St. Anthony's Hospital, around 19th in California. And uh, they moved to the uh, Cicero, and I don't know exactly the place, but it was in St. Anthony de Padua, uh Parish. But we were with my grandmother, uh, her parish was Queen of Heaven. Uh, 54th and 23rd Street. So I was baptized there, and then my folks got a uh, apartment or a basement flat or whatever it was close to Grandma's house. You know, not necessarily on the same street in Cicero. And then later they moved to Berwyn and Ridgeland and 26th Street. Mm -hmm. I have good memory from all this. So when you moved, well, even though you moved west, yeah, and you, you, you came back we, to the west side for high school, did you? Or yeah, and then we we uh, rented a house in Brookfield. My dad did, 
and uh, he worked in the city. And uh, I went to St. Barbara's uh, parochial school in Brookfield. There were 20 in my class, it was a small class. And um, there was 15 boys and five girls. I know the names of all five girls. And uh, I went to a, a reunion uh, last October. Wow. I was the only one from the class there. But uh, I know a lot of them passed away. But uh, there's there's one uh, uh, one fellow that uh, was a year behind me. He lives in Virginia, so he I, I, he he went into the service when I, when, uh, when I went into the service. So he's uh, alive. So when you were working at. Um at Allstate, then you you took the train back and forth to yeah yeah. Well, no, I took a bus at, at, because the bus they had a Bluebird bus, and it stopped one block from my house, and I uh, it was an express bus. Going into the city, it would pick up people. Once it got to the Chicago uh, Cicero Avenue, it would not pick up any more people. It would let them off but not pick them up. And they dropped me right at uh, Randolph and Wacker, right by the, uh, right by the uh, opera building. So were you, um, while you're at, um, when you're working at, um, working at Allstate, um, did you have Naval Reserve commitments or? No. No. I, I was uh, classified 1C, and, um, which was the, the normal thing. Uh, when I went to apply back to DePaul to do graduate work, they said you have to go into the naval, inactive naval reserve, and it's 4B. And I said, what does that mean? I said, do I have to go to classes or meetings or anything? No, you don't have to do anything. I said, because you're going to be down at DePaul, the closest location would be Purdue. And that's 50 some 52 miles or 55 miles. I said I don't have a vehicle to get there. There's no bus, you know. There's no transportation there. Nobody's going on a on a state highway. There's not that much traffic. He said, No, no, you don't have to go to any classes. It's just 4B. That's all. I said, Okay. Now comes the. Korean thing, uh, June 25th, 1950, started the Korean War. General Hershey and President Truman say, hey, we got a lot of guys that are in the Naval Reserve. <laughs> Didn't know what to do with them. Why don't we draft those people? for the Korean War. So Hershey was the head of the Selective Service, was he? No, Hershey, Hershey was a general. Yeah, was he head of, was he head of Selective Service for a while? I don't know what yeah, his yeah. title uh, yeah. you know, But anyhow, all of a sudden, I get a notice in October, I've been reclassified 1A. And of course, I'm 23 years old, <laughs> and they're taking people up to 25. I'm I'm going from not on the draft. They're going from 18 to. T I'm at the top of the list. I got the notice on a Saturday, and I'm 1A, and it says report for a physical on Tuesday. My goodness. And uh, I said, I, said I, I can't get in touch with the draft board. They were located at Harlem and, and uh, Ogden. And I knew where they were, you know, because I... So uh, what I did is I called the Navy right away. And they said, 
And since I'm in the Naval Reserve, and I get, to, oh yeah, they, they said they can do that. I said, uh, unless you're a cargo handler or a uh, some other thing, it's not going to be a Navy war. They're gonna, we're going to be off just providing s supplies to the Army. It's going to be a land thing. <laughs> so if you don't, you, we're not, we can't call you up back into the Navy. I said, well, well what, yeah, this was that you go check with your draft board, you know. So I, I went to the draft board and, and uh, I said, I, I'd like to have it reviewed. And uh, so they set up a point just to delay it. In December, the draft board met, and it was the vote was three to two against me. And I, the reason I got previous military service, you know, t two years, and there were two people. I don't know who they were. But they were on my side. You know, I was away from home and everything else, and other people haven't even gone in. You know, so I, uh, since it was December now. They weren't drafting anybody in December because of the holidays. They postponed it to January 15th of 51. And then they gave me 30 days to get my affairs in order. And February 15th of 51, I went into the Army into basic training. But the nice thing about it, there were there were a lot of other guys the same. There were nine of them, nine of us in the out of two hundred that had been in the navy before, and um, uh, it came to a a, a funny uh, decision. They asked uh, at one time the whole company how many people do not want GI insurance. So I raised my hand and the other eight raised their hand. We already had GI insurance. How can we get GI insurance? So everybody else was dismissed and this, this corporal took us to, to the captain. And uh, he asked us, you know, the corporal asked, what, why, why don't you want the GM? He said, I already have it. No, you don't. He said, no, you don't. He, everybody says, we have it, you know. He took us to the captain. And he goes in to the captain and tells uh, these nine fellows don't want the GI insurance. They say they have it. And he dismissed the corporal. He said, were you fellows in the service? Yeah, yeah, we're all in the Navy. That's what I thought, you know. He says, right now you go over to the PX. There's a Navy patch that you can put on your fatigues. Put it on your fatigues. You'll have no trouble whatsoever. And send the corporal back in here. <laughs> So we went over, got the Navy patch, sewed it on our fatigues. So now when we're in the barracks and they're looking for a detail for KP or something like that, they see the, the Navy patch on, they, they wouldn't pick us. They, Who's those guys with the Navy patch? <laughs> yeah. And the guys just say, because we were all disciplined. We knew we couldn't beat the system. Yeah. We we did the training and everything else, you know, and uh, so. But I had all this education. Fortunately enough, uh, I I had uh, a friend that of my folks that came back from Korea, and he was stationed at Camp Breckenridge in Kentucky. That's where I was, and uh, he said that. Uh, his name was Lefersky. He was a colonel. 
you know, it's just pretty high, uh, high up the chain. And he said, have Ken come to see me. Because I know him. He's been at my family's house and everything before the, you know, the war. The war. <coughs> so I go in there, and the sergeant's there, and I come in with fatigues and a patch on He says, I would, I'd like to see the colonel, you know, Colonel Lefersky. What do you want to see him for? You know, he's a, you're, you know, this is, he's a personal friend of, of, of mine. He looks at you, you know, you're the colonel and you're a private, you know. So he opens the door and says, Colonel, there's a, a private Ken Lee here. Oh, yeah, send him in. You know? And he says, go on in, you know. He looked at, he said, I, I've talked to the captain over at the classification. And uh, he said, just when when they attempt to classify, just, just say you want to go next higher level to so get to Captain Roberts. I'll never forget the name. So I got to Captain Roberts. And he had the MOS book about that thick, and uh, he says, "You got how many years of college? You got five and a half years of." Of college graduate work in mathematics and all, he said. Well, I th this will get you into a machine records unit, which is IBM equipment. And I'm familiar with that. He said you may go overseas. You know, he says may not. You know, he said, but you get in one of those units, you they desperately need you, people like that. So. I uh, put, I said, well, what is, what's the classification? He said, well, read it. And it, it was scientific professional specials. And I said, and the MOS was uh, 1400. I remember that. And I got, I have uh, my orders I have in some it's one of these things that I brought. And that's what it shows. And I, I went, to, uh, I got into that unit. And of course, it was just like, <laughs> it was just like going into the, a mass unit with all the characters. <laughs> we had them all. And uh, the first guy that I met, I, I relate to this, uh, to radar that knows everything, you know. and. Uh, this uh, this fellow's name was Billy Bangs, and he never got my orders. You know, I got my orders here, and it says 32nd MRI. I didn't get your orders, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, that's how I got into it, and uh, uh, then everything was messed up because now they're 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 first of all. The fact that they found out I was in the Navy, I became a, instead of E1, I was an E2. And I, got, I just got out of basic. I, I got, I, I was PFC. And everybody else was a, <laughs> didn't have a stripe. They were still, a, they were an E2, but I was a PFC. But I got all that pay coming for every two years that I was in the Navy Reserve. Added on to my PFC, so I was making more than a corporal on the pay. And the one who became corporal was making more than a sergeant, and the guys couldn't figure it out. But I, the education paid off, and that's what uh, saved me. You're still in good shape athletically, and, yeah. and so you didn't have any trouble with basic. I, no, I played uh, basic training or. No, Running around or push-ups or mopping or anything, no problem. No, I uh, well, even when I was in Seattle, Washington, I was, I, I, I talked to the war warrant officer, and he, he came and said, "Do you play golf?" And I said, "Yeah, I play golf." He says, "So what do you shoot?" And I said, "Well, low 80s, sometimes in the 70s." Oh, you got to be on the golf team. I said, "Hey, I just got here, you know." I said, "How am I going to?" Play golf with my work. Don't worry. I, who's your sergeant? 
and talk to the sergeant. He says, when I come in and ask for uh, PFC leave, he's, you're going to excuse him, aren't you? He says, yes, <laughs> he did. So he comes in right over the, the next day, or the next week, and, and he says, I got, a, I got an assignment for you. I'm going to talk to Art to, to get you. We're going to play golf. So, so right, what he's going to do, he goes over to Art, and, uh, and Art comes over, you're excused. He says, and I talked to, uh, his name was Rogers, and he says, uh, we're going to play golf. I said, I don't have any golf clothes. I said, I got your golf clothes and everything. We went out, never played the course before. I shot an 82, he shot an 82. And uh, he says, you're on the team. You know, he says, I'll get you off for practice. I'll get you off for, you know, to play golf. I said, I'm supposed to work around here, you know. He said, oh, don't, don't worry about that, you know. Then they found out I played baseball. And I was playing baseball with uh, an old-time baseball player's son, Earl Averill of the Cleveland Indians. He was a, an all-star player. His, his son was a catcher on our team. So now I'm playing baseball. On, you know. What position? What, what position? I played the outfield. Um. Yeah, and uh, that's, uh, that's the way it went. And I, they said, do you bowl? Yeah, I bowl. What's your average? It's about 180 to 85. In those days, that was you know, 180, yeah. You're on the team. <laughs> well, I, I decided to ask for uh, the night shift. A friend of mine was on the night shift he, that I buddied with him. He came, got, came out of basic out of New Jersey and uh, with his bride. And she's got a bank job in Seattle, and he's got the night shift. You know, they never see each other. I said, Jim, I said, what if I went on nights? Could I take the, learn the night shift? I'll do it on my own. He said, yeah. I said, then you can transfer to the day shift. Okay. So I went in there on the nights. I was playing golf during the day, so I went on nights, and I was helping him out and everything. So he talks to a different warrant officer, and he says, I'd like to get on days. And he says, oh, no, I can't, you can't, uh, Jim, you're too valuable. No, Ken is, knows the work. He was sitting here helping me, you know. Oh, well, have him come in next week, too, and I'll, I'll be around to watch him, you know. So we did that. I became the night supervisor because I knew more. I knew more than Jim, just, you know, and as a result, then we had a made it. I could be off during the day any time I wanted. You still had enough time to sleep, so you were... For the, for the athletic and I, it w I hate to admit this, but in the course of a uh, of a month, a month, I had only worked 30 hours the whole month. I was constantly going to a baseball game, <laughs> a golf tournament, and uh, my niece. I found out I, I have, I wrote a lot of letters, a lot of letters. I was going through some of the letters. I, I mean, in the two-year period in, in Seattle, and uh, I had maybe 600 letters that I had written home, but I always talked about home things first in the paragraph. Then I say, this is what I did in the in the service. And as a result, I still have all those, and they're all on the computer now. And uh, I, I brought one book that the basic training that I did in Kentucky, I got to have it all documented, wow. Every, everything that I did. 
I took it to a reunion. For the, I was in the, down there, I was assigned to the Company K in the 101st Airborne Division out of Kentucky. And I, I, I gave that to, I wanted it back, you know, because I had pictures in it and, and everything that we did in the way of uh, uh, machine guns and BARs and so forth. So it was an interesting life, to say the least. Changing the tape here. So the um, so the basic training in um, in um, Camp Breckenridge that lasted a 14 weeks. 14 weeks. Then it's tra then it's by train to to Fort Lawton. Yeah. And, and then you're in Fort Lawton until. Uh, uh, well, we moved to Fort Lewis uh, the last month. But I, I got to uh, uh, Fort uh, Lawton was on June 7th of, of 51. And uh, they, they were closing down Fort Lawton. They, they were going to turn it in. They did turn it into a, a park in Seattle. It's a beautiful piece of land there. And, and uh, in fact, they had a golf course on there. Uh, it was, so we're going to move to Fort Lewis, and that, uh, as a result of that, uh, we had a move in January. You know, and I'm getting out in February. So when we moved to January, that's the only work that, uh, like Jim and I did, was the move, and Jim and I went into the separation. We center waiting to be separated from the service. So as a result, we just waited. You know, we had nothing to do. His wife was up in Seattle, and if we had nothing to do that day, we'd drive back up to Seattle, and they had the apartment there. So I'd stay with them, and then we'd come back the next day. And then finally, when we got on the list to get separated. Uh, Jim got separated, uh, I think, a day or two before I did. I just stayed down there, and I had a car at that time, you know. So, and then I drove back from Seattle. The the records um, that you're working with were they primarily personnel records or? No, uh, these were uh, IBM production or uh, pr uh, we creating uh, boats. That were going to Sasebo, Japan, of of men going to Korea, the Far East Command. And once they go in Korea, they go to Japan first. And uh, fortunately, uh, the fellow at the other end in Japan was a fellow that worked at Allstate. That I knew, so we were blaming each other. And what would happen? Uh, we put the uh, IBM cards. Because the, these, this, n nobody going overseas, you had to have a serial number, you had to have an MOS, uh, a military uh, occupation special uh, uh, thing. Uh, if you were a, a rifleman, you were 0007. If you were a WAC, you were 0008. If you were a combat uh, trained, on you'd be a 4745. If you were a cook, you'd be at 3060. You know, all the different numbers. That everybody had an MOS, and if they didn't have an MOS, you'd look at their name and you said, eh, he's probably a truck driver. You know, <laughs> and we'd put in a truck driver. You may be never know how to drive. But then we had the ones going to Alaska. Now, Alaska was not involved in the war, but they were concerned about the Alaska. They had uh, personnel up there, Navy and Army up there. And a friend of mine from the Navy that I knew was up there. He was a dentist. He got sent to Kodiak, Alaska. And uh, his wife and child came through Fort Lawton. They stayed in the dependence 
and there was only one boat that went up there, and it went up there about every two weeks. We would create that for the dependents and those personnel that are going up there to take the places of the ones that are there. And did each of those have to have a punch, uh, an IBM card? Yeah. 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 And then when they got to Korea, you know, they were going, all going to combat units. You know, there were replacements. Nobody going to Korea was getting a separation thing. But when they come back from Sasebo, back to Seattle, now these are guys that are coming back. They could be going to a separation center to get out of the Navy, uh, Army, or they could be going on furlough to be reassigned, so that was a separate color card. And there was another one that maybe they they were a whole unit, that they, they, a special unit. They would go in an intact unit, and they would go together, because they were in a V, maybe a, an army unit, or it might be a, uh, an, uh, they had some in, uh, American Indian, Units that were all American Indians, you know the the talkers. Yeah, Navajo code talkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the code talkers, and uh, we'd ship them over with an intact unit, and you know all of a sudden they get a change of orders, and of course they're going to Korea, and they get a change of orders with a fax or something, and they said, "Don't go to Japan. You go to Australia." We didn't know that they went there. You know, the people in Japan are waiting for them to come, and they're not getting in there to get there. And that's happened, you know. And they're lost some places in the Pacific. But it uh, it was it was the responsibility of the Sixth Army because that, that was uh, that's what we did. But uh, it uh, there was a lot. To, I I sent uh, in fact. Just recently, uh, the Lion King played uh, at the Palace Theater. Yes. And the assistant conductor was the baby that went with his mother up to my friend in Kodiak that was the dentist. He's 51 years old. And he, he, he came, I sent a note up to the through the ushers, I wanted to talk to the assistant conductor and uh, Douglas Reed, and uh, so I'll, I'll have the head usher come talk to you. So I wrote out a message. He said, I, "Last time I saw you, you were a baby, and so forth." And and I'm I'm the guy that met you when you came off the ship. I said that they they were coming back. Uh, they came back with two babies. You know, uh, his sister was born up in Alaska, and uh, I said, I'll be wearing a red jacket because when I look up at the ship, everybody's going to have a Navy uniform on it, you know, or an Army uniform. There's nobody going to have a red jacket. You can find me, but I can't, I can't find you. And I picked him up, and we went to lunch, and I took him to the train, and I still talk to his wife uh, out in Connecticut. He passed away last year. Uh, your your good friend from was it Jim? With the, uh, with Jim the, with was the night shift man that you. Uh, he he's in an Alzheimer's uh, unit. I just got a letter. Uh, uh, every Christmas I send out Christmas cards, and then if I get cards back, or I don't hear from anybody in February. I follow up. In fact, when I get home, uh, I found out where this one guy is, and I got a message last night about 11 o'clock when I got home. It says, "Call me tomorrow morning," you know. But he's out in Arizona, so it's you know it's still morning out there. You know, it's gonna call later on, and uh, we found this guy, and he's out in Arizona. And we've been looking for him for two years. So do you still have um, these strong associations, friendships with um, 
people from the Navy and the Army, or is it primarily the Army, or no. both? Um, the Navy is getting more. I lost three guys from the Navy last year. I went to. I was able to go to one waking funeral in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he was in the same boat. He was called back, and uh, he almost had the same thing. He he was about to go on, on a ship, and he <laughs> he was in California. And an admiral's aide came up and he says, anybody here play golf? You know, and you know, a couple of hands. And he said, what do you shoot? What do you shoot? And my friend Ron, he was a good golfer. He was on a golf team at uh, Dubois. He says, your orders are changed. You're going to go to Hawaii with... You're going to be the golf. You're going to play golf with the admiral in Hawaii. <laughs> That's what he did. He was all set to go on a ship, and they they pulled him out. Well, he died in Madison. The other fellow, he died in. Uh, his wife died a couple of years ago, and he died in uh, I Iowa. And uh, I heard through the grapevine on that that he was sick. And the other fellow was the dentist uh, that was up in Alaska. He died last March. But did you um, did you join um, the, you, like the VF, VFW or American Legion or oh, I, the formal organizations? Uh, uh, yeah. I was in the Sons of the American Legion because Begin of my dad. And as soon as I enlisted, I became an, a member mm -hmm. of the American Legion. I've got over 70 years in the and, American And you're active in the... I, I am a paid up for life. And uh, I, our, our post is down to about 30 people. And I went to the, the last meeting that I went to, there was only three of us, the commander, another officer, and myself. <laughs> is that post in Brookfield? Or yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so this, the, the commander says, okay, he said to his, I can't remember his, his uh, what po uh, position he said, you make a motion that I pay for the lunch, and Ken, you second the motion, and I'll buy the lunch for the three of us. <laughs> and that's what we did. <laughs> when you came out of the service the second time, that would have been in 1953, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any trouble getting into the job market then, or no? You were able, were you able no. to go back to? I, I, of course, I went into the Army Reserve for five years, no meetings and everything else. I, I got out of that in in 1950. I got out early. Uh, I was 1957, so I, based on that, I was 30 years old, and I I went in when I was 17. You know, it's 13 years that of I got four discharges. Yeah. I finally got a discharge from the Naval Reserve. So when you were in the the Army Reserve, were there monthly meetings? I, I missed that. I didn't go to any monthly. I was I was. I was in a MP reserve unit out of Cicero, Illinois. Never went there, nothing. And then they said of five years, they cut it, cut it down. And I got out two two years sooner. Yeah. And did but you go back to work for Allstate? Yeah, oh, I went sorry, back yeah. to Allstate. So, but I, when I went back, I could get my old job. Okay, but this one fellow. Uh, that had helped me out to uh, get, you know, when I was t to learn some of the IBM equipment, he said, hey, we're, we're going into computers. And with your background, they're going to set, set up a research group. I said, you can come back and get your old job, and they'll give you a raise, you know. 
or you can come back and work for me and I can give you all the overtime you want. And in six months, they're going to set up this research group for computers and they want you to be in it. But by working a six months to a year with your overtime, you know, and I, I think at that, you know, I was maybe like $300 a month or something. I, I'd be up at, maybe with the overtime, I'd be up at $600 a month, you know. Well, when I used to go to approach you to get, get you changed, to, you know, I got back, you know, in February or March. He says, if it, if it doesn't come through in August, it'll be in the first of the next year. You'll have a whole year of payroll, double year payroll. Now if they want you. They got to give you a raise from there, <laughs> and that's what happened. So another fellow, math degree, graduate work. I was math, graduate work. Our boss was finance person. He was at all the contests. So now we're traveling to see what GE has, RCA, control data, all the different companies, IBM, Univac, all the different computers. We could tell, we went to all the schools, I, I, I pro programmed every, every computer. I programmed the Bat Batman's computer. I can still do it, it's still in my head. I can write a program for that right now. What language would that be, in COBOL or? Uh it was before. It oh, was, before that. It was yeah. all hard coded. There were no operating systems mm -hmm. in those days. You know, if, if I said 64, 74, 02, this is clear and add, add, start. Those are the same codes that are in there, my head right now. And if it, this, this stores it and clears it out. It, if it's a 12, it stores it, but it doesn't clear it out. It stays in the register. All the different things. So we could do it by, in our biggest thing, we had a, a drum, and we're talking milliseconds, not, not nanoseconds and everything that you got now. Milliseconds. And it was 8.5 milliseconds. That was fast in those days, but this drum rotated and they had the same information you could put in 20 different spots on this drum. So you put the first instruction here and you time it out is how far, when, when was that instruction be executed so you get ready to do the second one. It might be all the way over here. That would be the end of number one. So you want to put your number two instruction right here. Now the two instruction would go all the way around here and it ends right here. That's the two. Well then you want to put your th number three instruction here and you fill up these 20 spots. And as a result, it made a big difference to the company because we we're going to go through this thing and you had 20 instructions that you can put in this loop and that's what we did. So we, we went to, uh, finally we went to uh, the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia. We had Bob and myself. Our boss's name was Van, and Fred was the salesman for the company. And 
the salesman go out of the room, you know, and Dan, our boss, says, what do you think? And he said, we can make it work. Bob and I said, yeah, we can do it. It's a scientific computer, but we don't have to use all that. We don't have to use sines and cosines and stuff. If it adds, subtracts, and multiplies and divides, you know, this, that's what the, you're going to do. You, you're going to have ratios for the, you know, the programs and stuff. They said, we could write a, a program, and we have a program that it takes three months to do with tabular cards. We can do it in less than a, a, a day on the computer. Less than a day. Wow. He said, that's a lot of savings. That other guy can do other things then. Yeah. All the girls that have calculators on the desk, all the calculators go. They don't lose their job. They get something that's a little more interesting, you know. You know, they, 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 they had a lot of background. I, so that's what we did. And uh, I, go, I went to uh, went to school in Poughkeepsie with IBM. I was there for eight weeks with programmers of all the Bank of America. A uh, couple guys that were high up in... Uh, Silver, Silicon Valley, the guy from uh, with the Dow Chemical, you know, all we were there, living, living, the, 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 learning about these machines that hadn't even come on the market. We had a non-disclosure agreement with IBM. All state had it, and White Sands Proving Ground, the only two that had. And the one condition our boss said to, to the, like IBM, if you make an offer to Bob or Ken, you're out. Don't try to steal them from us. So we didn't have to worry about anything. And then our boss, you know, they had a management bonus. I, he, we crashed that. We're not management. We're tech, technical people. He said, these are the guys that are doing the work. You have a problem in Atlanta. Who do you call in? You call Ken and Bob and Jim, who's responsible for Atlanta. He said, what do I tell them down in Atlanta? And Bob says, I think we tell them to go to number 300, and we'll start from there. So now the boss, that's my band's boss, Jim. Go to 300, and, and then tell me what you got in 300. What do I do next? You know, he, he tells us, he says, we want to see what's in there, you know. All of a sudden, Jim is a hero in Atlanta, <laughs> and we're so we got in the bonus pool. So you made your career then with uh, yeah. Allstate Insurance. Did you um, ever give any thought to staying in the in the in the, in the service, which might have had a use for your? If talents? I went, if I went in again, I'd stay in. Mm -hmm. I had four years of service and nine years. Of reserve time, I only need six. I only get uh, twenty years is all I need. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, I, you know. Of course, Vietnam didn't start until later. I was beginning to think you're wondering how <laughs> I'm going to be no, no, three no. times. You know. I I know. No. But uh, it was a uh, it was a great ride. But it, it uh, you know it's. It's, you know, I, I didn't go overseas, you know, and I did, you know, I, I learned to, I learned how to, to shoot mortars and uh, bazooka guns and BARs, and I said, hey, if they, if that's what they want me to do, yeah, you know, 
I couldn't hit that flag with a with a 45. I got, you know, I was great at 500 yards, but if they get any closer, I throw the rifle at them <laughs> to not shoot them because it was it was difficult. But uh, you know, I met some nice nice people. I did uh, did do what I was told to do, and I could do it a lot better. Yeah, you, you I said. Some of the things that, uh, you know, Bob and I did were quite closely together, you know. And uh, when they say, you know, when they're going, when the post is just going from 10 cents to 12 cents in a big company like Allstate, or, uh, and they're sending out, you know, 30, 36, thousand pieces of mail and you're spending another two cents it's that's twenty percent increase we came up with a idea is that if you have a, a savings account and they used to have a, a limit of ten thousand dollars that was covered but if you said uh, okay uh, in like in my case if it was Ken Lee and my wife's name could be Claire Lee, and my daughter's name would be Barbara Lee. You know, all the different combinations. We could get seven different combinations. And we're sending out first class mail to seven people at the same address. That doesn't make sense. What if you only sent out one? There's only one person going to read it, and they might not even read it. We saved a ton of money. We went from 36,000 pieces of mail down to under 13,000. $23,000. 23,000. And that was just one location. And the, the other thing we worked on, Bob and I, you know, you go into a, a, a big, company like Allstate and other companies, they had file cabinets. Got your policy in there. You got a credit report. I went to the bank yesterday, okay? I got X number of dollars in that bank. I went to another bank, X number, oh fine, I'm, I'm set. If I got a credit report and everything, it would be great. I could spend that today, and I might write a check, I'll just make up some figures, $20,000. I don't have $20,000 in that bank. The check would bounce, right? My credit would be gone. They had all these pieces of paper that they were saving in there. I said, why are you saving all those credit reports? It's only good on the day that you get it. The next day, it doesn't mean a thing. What do you mean? Yeah. What? No, the guy could be broke. He got on to Vegas and he lost all his money. What good is the looking up his credit report? We put the, a program together to get rid of the filing cabinet. Look at all the space that they see. Mm. They have a thousand... They had a thousand filing cabinets in the Allstate building over on on the Edens. A thousand of them. What are you going to do with them? I said, get rid of them. Get rid of what? What? Are, what? Are, what are, microfiche was the right. thing at mm -hmm. that time. You could put on microfiche. They had index, index cards, just tables, three or four tables that would be longer than this board table of accidents and everything. Why do you, you go in and pull out a, a three by five card and say, oh, you had an accident back in so and so. Put it on a microfiche. <laughs> you know, why is all this space that they, 
And they, uh, some of the stuff, they, they, they're, they're behind in their filing. They're behind in the filing. If the person goes over there and it isn't in there, they can't find it, you know, <laughs> because they haven't got the stuff in there. A lot of different things. So, so it got to the point where we were kind of specialists in the company. You know, if a person had a, a problem, pricing had a problem, they, they never wanted to exceed State Farm in the prices. I said, but they, they would round upward or downward depending on the situation. You got that's that's old hat. You don't always do it subjectively, like, oh yeah, we have to do round downward on this one. I said, you look at Chicago and rate a policy, and we'll rate a policy on the computer, and we'll have less errors than you are. You got a a person going through the rate manual. And she picks up a, a rate that is for Will County farmland, and it should have been the city of Chicago. And they give them a real low rate. Mm. The, the customer says, "Oh, it's pretty good. I'll take that." You know. So we lose money on it. He said, "He has an accident in Chicago." It's the opposite. If you overcharge them. What's going to happen? He'll go to another company. <laughs> you overcharged him. You lost a customer. So you're losing money when you keep the customer keeping the wrong rate. And we finally, we finally got to the point where we we took, I forget how many hundreds of, we rated them and they rated them and then we compared them, you know. And we showed them where, where they made errors. And they didn't even know they were making errors. They were on the wrong page. Eliminate, yeah, eliminate human error, I imagine. Yeah. And, uh, make it, uh, so these people, uh, once you had their confidence with the computers, you know, then we had information support units, and I was in, in that area. And, uh, a guy from accounting calls me. Hey, I got a problem. I said, well, "What's your problem?" And so yeah, I can do that. He said, "But don't go through the channels to do it. You'll never get it done. They'll have to see how much it's going to cost. Just give, give me the your information. I'll have it back to you. I'll look at it. I'll have it back in a day or so." And that's what they do. And I just put down on my sheet miscellaneous project, and he he's happy. He got his work done. I'm happy. My boss knows that I'm not doing it that way. But you know, he, you know, different 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 things. Yeah. You know, they said uh, you know when they had uh, See, affirmative the, action group. Yeah. Women, you know. Name like Lee. Hey, I can be an Indian. I can be an Asian. Yeah. I could go right up to the. Oh. Yeah. So this one, I'm in charge of getting all these things to to submit. What What would you like to do in the next year? What was your next position? And one guy said, I'd like to be a a senior uh, uh, supervisor. You know, what is your long range goal? Assistant Vice President. I put that right on the top, you know. And he's got a Hispanic name, you know. I go into my boss and so I got all the things for the affirmative action. You may want to read the first one of you. He looked at it. Assistant Vice President. He says, You gotta change that. No, I, I can't change. That's what this fellow believes. He's going to be a senior supervisor, and then he's, his long range is going to be a He said, I can't change it. 
He says, that's his thoughts. Oh, no, change it. I said, I'm not changing it. If you want to change it, you, you talk to Frank. <laughs> so, this fellow's name was Jim. We didn't get along too well, but he said, I'll call Frank. Okay. <coughs> he calls Frank and he says, you have to, will you uh, see Ken? He wants to bring something over to you. He says, sure. So I go over. I talk to his secretary. He says, uh, Frank wants to see me, you know. And I got the, the forms. And I, I says, uh, Jim, uh, I just want to read to change this affirmative action form. I can't change it. But I want you to read it. Because he's an assistant vice president. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at it. He says, and he used some language that I don't use, you know. And he says, I was wondering, you know, who the <laughs> is going to pick my spot. Send it in the way it is. I said, will you call Jim and tell him that you're going to send it in the way it is. I'll give you the whole sheets right here and I'll give it to your secretary. Well, Jim didn't like it. You know, he said, he liked it. Because that's the way he is, you know. And then, you know, nobody could get along to that guy, Frank. And I, I met him, though, in uh, Pittsburgh. Never, never met him. And we were, he was in the Pittsburgh area, and I was on another assignment there. And uh, I uh, said, so you going out to dinner? I said, yeah, I don't know where to go. And he said, oh, I, I know a place. Why don't we go together? You know, that's how I met him. And we, you know, the first time, and you know, our past fought. And then later, he came into the corporate, and he became my the big boss. You know, so as a result, we had a good time and everything. But uh, it was uh, there's a lot of things. Yeah, thinking about just thinking like the the army is a big big company, big organization, big bureaucracy involved too. And then Allstate is a big company with lots of departments, and you were able to. You know, well, I went all over, everywhere. The, yeah. all over the country. Yeah. You know, I, we put I put in uh, uh, teleprocessing lines. I, I hooked up uh, Salem with Seattle, uh, Menlo Park with Sacramento, uh, Santa Ana with Pasadena. If it hadn't been for that. Um, that early enlistment college officer track in the Navy. W would you have been able to go to as good a college as DePaul? I, I, if it wasn't, I probably wouldn't have gone to college. That's one thing. I, I worked in a uh, drugstore. <coughs> My first job. Uh, I caddied uh, at a golf course making 70 cents for hauling a bag around that broke my back, you know. And uh, I got a job for at the drugstore, 25 cents an hour. And uh, it was a Rexall drugstore. Uh, and uh, I, I really worked hard, you know. And uh, I did a good job the first week, and uh, he raised me to 30 cents for the second week. It got to the point where I was helping out the, the soda fountain, and uh, they had a lot of reports to do. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, you know, I'm 15 years old. I was playing basketball. Drugstores were open from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. And uh, every bill that you wanted to pay, uh, gas bill, you write down the number and what the, the amount they would collect the bill. They got a nickel for every 
one that was on there. I did the electric bills, uh, the uh, gas bills. Uh, I, I, that's about all. I think uh, the water was separate. I think just those two. And I did it, you know, I knew how to do that. Then I got a, I went to the cigarettes and the candy and the magazines. I was in charge of that. And we put no magazines that were, no police gazettes out. Uh, everything that was uh, shocking and stuff, we put them underneath. If somebody asked for them, then you could give them. But no, none of the kids could see them. We had, the, you know, the Life and the Look magazine and uh, uh, the Journal and McCall's and all of these things. But none of these de detective stories and stuff like Lurid, that. Lurid. Uh, yeah. yeah. Comic books. Then I got cigars and cigarettes. Can't sell them to kids, you know. Have to have a note from the parents. And then you have to take the note up and give it to the the boss, the directors, I couldn't accept it as a no, you know. And of course, with the war, you know, was uh, during those days, you know. So I was, you know, it was hard to to work when I was going to school, but in the summertime I was working, and then on the weekends I'd work, you know. And uh, so it got to the point where. I, I used to check the, the drugs that were coming in, and I helped the druggists. And you know, I always commented in the wonderful life in regard to Jimmy Stewart. And again, the drug is is prescribing the wrong things. Yeah, our druggist, he he said, get that white bottle up there with the black lettering on it. Bring it here, and he would come. He said, he make sure this is the one, okay, count 20 of these out there. And I put them in five, 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 and, and put the cap on it. And, and he says, yeah, okay, and put it in this bottle. And he had the bottle all made up with the directions and everything else. So, you know, because in those days they were making salves and they had a, 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 a pistol. And, yeah, boy, and, and pistol, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all that stuff. But the ones that were capsules and stuff we did. And it, it was uh, interesting. And he had a code. The code I still know also. He, he had codes of what the cost of the thing was. And uh, it was a situation of markings that are certain situations. And you you look at it, and that would be the code of that particular drug or toothpaste or whatever it was. And the the thing is, it would be one, two, three, four, and this X meant you repeated the four again. So this would be the the value of it. And then you you went on to other symbols. And you, the thing is, it would come in, and I was I would code it for him, and he'd look at it. And say, yeah, that's right. Now the, the rule is, when you put things away, you'll always put it back in the same spot. If you hit toothpaste here, you know, and you hit shaving cream here. Didn't make any sense. He still put the toothpaste here and the shaving cream here. Never changed the positions. <laughs> so the thing is, if somebody was out of something, I put the stuff where I knew where to go down in the basement. And when a, a new person came, well, where's the toothpaste? You know, well, it's in with the, by the shaving cream. What? <laughs> Don't tell. We don't change anything. <laughs> it was a real experience, and I was detailed enough to. to so you might have gone into the drugstore business. You think you're. Right? I would. They, he would have sponsored me for to become a druggist. Yeah. 
because he asked me at one time, you know, and then the thing is, uh, the war was going on. He lost uh, uh, one of the fellows, one in the Army. Army, he was married, had a child. So was the druggist the owner of the store? Yeah. Yeah. So as we approach yeah. the end of the interview, um, there's a couple of questions we yeah. always ask. Um, uh, and you've anticipated these uh, to a degree. Um, uh, Mr. Lee, how do you think your service and experiences affected your life? Uh, it made it a lot easier uh, for me, especially, especially uh, the information that I gathered meeting people. And, and uh, I used to be afraid to uh, talk, <laughs> not, not anymore. Uh, I got involved with charities. Uh, I've, I've become. I, I used to grab a microphone and my hand used to shake. I uh, I had I had the Marriott on Michigan Avenue. Eleven hundred and ten people for dinner. And they all found a place to sit down. I had it on the computer and. And uh, once, you know, I was the MC, and uh, unbeknownst to me, the, that was the night that they uh, uh, gave me the state deputy's medal for, uh, it was a rare occasion. You know, and they said, you know, I started it with the Knights of Columbus, and I've gone up through many chains. I was uh, head of the CYO in uh, Chicago, um, recently, well, I was Citizen of the Year in Niles, and I was uh, the Day of the Year in the state of Illinois in 2007, all because of uh, different things that are responsible. I, I've been responsible for over two million dollars in charities. It's, it was uh, I was in charge of uh, from Indiana to Iowa and, and uh, uh, I-80 to Wisconsin, and in charge of the, all the awards that uh, went out that year, and we collected a million seven hundred thousand dollars for. The uh, intellectually disabled uh, people, and uh, that the Knights uh, support that. So it, it uh, just taking on the responsibilities when they came, and you want to get it done, I, I'll do it. And this last question, uh, Mr. Lee, how do you think your military experience? Um, influenced or influences your thinking about war or about the military in general? I think it's a, it's a real learning experience. I, I would advocate it, uh, that everybody should go in. You, you learn to just some of the things that happen or are happening now that uh, uh, with the youth, uh, it's a good thing to, to, to go in. You learn how to, if you, you learn the discipline that you have to do. And you, you, things you say you can't do, you can do them. You know, you, you can do it. I do, you know, some of the things that uh, uh, you, you go through and uh, you wonder what. Uh, why you, you, you know, uh, I was not too much a, uh, of a camper as such, you know, uh, you know, but uh, you, you learn a lot of little things that uh, help you out, you know, if you're on the side of a hill, you better have a big rock at the, in your, you know, your tent or you'll be, you'll be down in the valley for real quick. Mr. Lee, is there anything you'd like to add to the interview that perhaps we haven't covered? Well, 
I'm writing a lot of stuff myself. Uh, I'm, I'm writing memoirs. Uh, of, I started in the early ages and everything because I, 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 I don't want to. I just want to get it down. A lot of the things uh, are, you know, are private and everything. Uh, but uh, I. Uh, I did have a health problem early in life, and uh, uh, different things. Uh, I have a saving uh, saying that I uh, just just say no. And uh, my daughters think that uh, it's a uh, situation of uh, different activities and everything. And I made a promise to my wife. When uh, I was struck with a cancer uh, in 2000, and um, she said, "Don't you dare die before I do." So I said no to cancer, and uh, I did whatever I had to do. And fortunately, a lot of stuff that I mentioned earlier, I never smoked, which was a, that gave me a, a, when I was taking the chemo, that uh, the fact that I had three of the lymph nodes out of 21, that was roughly 15%, but that it might occur again, and uh, but I didn't smoke, and it says you can automatically cut that in half, so it's down to seven and a half. Uh, uh, that was in 2000. It's now 2014, and uh, I'm down to only he checks me once a year now. But then I was hit with cancer again, uh, prostate cancer in 2005 which is a little more difficult. Uh, my wife was uh, disabled in 98, and uh, she repeated this, don't you dare die before I did. And uh, so I did, uh, uh, I took hormone shots, I took radiation, I took, uh, I had to sign up for, uh, what was it, 25 radiation treatments. And, but at the end of 18, I was able to take a volume test. Uh, and if I passed the volume test, uh, then I wouldn't have to take any more radiation. And I said, well, what's the volume test? And I said, oh, we'll look at it, you know. Oh, it's the worst test I ever took. <laughs> and uh, I passed it. And uh, so then I stopped radiation for a whole month. And uh, we had a reunion, and all the kids and everything. And uh, they all came in, and we went to... Uh, an area where he had gone for for his vacations, the whole family, and it was pretty serious. And uh, I had a procedure. Uh, they implanted radium seeds, and it went pretty well. And I was back to normal again. And uh, my PSA was undetectable and uh, so I kept the promise and she passed away in uh, 2007 so I kept the, the, the thing going you know and I gave my daughters a, a birth stone with a just say no and I started to cut back on my activities and that's what I did and uh, so they think it's my activities I cut back on, but uh, 
uh, last year I, I had to go in, I had a, a relapse on the, uh, uh, on the prostate cancer. And uh, I spent eight days in the hospital and uh, had another procedure. And fortunately, uh, uh, it's almost a year now since I've been out and I'm, I'm still good. And uh, so just working on that is uh, a, ch a challenge. And uh, but uh, from the same point of uh, I accept it uh, and uh, yeah, it seems like from the early days you uh, you accept the challenges and you can go with the flow and on the basis of your uh, yeah. your natural talents you make the best of it. But I brought some pictures you wanted, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I I'm going to conclude the interview then, yeah. Mr. Lee, and say thank you very much. I'm glad you said yes to the interview. <laughs>